You're listening to the Finding Christ in the Old Testament series, preaching by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, and look with me. 2 Samuel chapter 8 this morning, starting at verse number 1. And after this, it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And David took meth out of the land, or the hand of the Philistines, and he smote Moab and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground, even with two lines measured he to put to death, and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. David smote also Hated Ezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zoab, as he went to recover the border at the river of Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots and, and a hundred and seven hundred horsemen and twenty thousand footmen. And David hoed all the chariot horses, but reserved of them for an hundred chariots. When the Syrians of Damascus came to succor Hadad Ezer, the king of Zobath, David slew of the Syrians two and twenty thousand men. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus. And the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadad Ezer and brought them to Jerusalem and from Beta and from Beroli, cities of Hadad Ezer, King David took exceeding much brass. When Toy, king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all the host of hated Ezer, then Toy sent Joram, his son, unto the king to salute him and to bless him because he had fought against hated Ezer and smitten him, for hated Ezer had wars with Toy. And Joram brought with him vessels of silver and vessels of gold and vessels of brass, which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and gold that he had dedicated of all nations which he subdued of Syria, and of Moab, of the children of Ammon, of the Philistines, and of Amalek, and of the spoil of Hadad Ezer, son of Rehab, king of Zobah. And David gat him a name when he returned from smiting the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, being 18,000 men. And he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom put he garrisons, and they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever He went, and David reigned over all Israel, and David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the host, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder, and Zodak, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the sons of Abathar, were the priest, and Sariah was the scribe, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over both the Cherethites, and the Pelethites, and David's sons were chief rulers. This is the word of the Lord. May we see it this morning for what it truly is. When the last amen is said on Sunday morning, the first thought that I have after I leave the church is this. Where are we going next week? Now, it's, it's somewhat easy because we go through the Bible systematically, but every Sunday afternoon the thought is, okay, where do we go next? It never ends. It never ends. I've been doing this now for 15 years, and, and on my phone I just took it off, but at the top of my list every week is message. It's almost like laundry. It just never, ever ends. And so I knew what we would be in chapter 8, and I, so I read chapter 8, and I thought, chapter 8 is interesting, David crushes his enemies, but what's really cool is chapter 9. Chapter 9 is the story of Mephibosheth, and if you don't know that story, you ought to read it this week. It's a fantastic story of a man who had nothing to offer, and yet he sits at the king's table daily. There's great truth there. And I thought to myself this week, We'll just mention chapter 8, we'll skip through it, work to chapter 9, because chapter 9 is the great story of Mephibosheth. We'll skip chapter 8. 
As we read chapter 8 this morning, I'm sure you could see that it was basically, you know, simplistically put in three parts. The first part, verses 1 through uh, 8, is David crushing his enemies. And I mean crushing them. The writer makes it clear, verses 1, 2, 3, 5, reiterated in verse 13, that David is kicking bums and taking names. There, there's no one who is standing before him. He is crushing his enemies. And as you look at the, the layout of the land, north, south, east, west, David is expanding the kingdom. And there's a phrase that Hadad Ezer comes up over and over again, and the, the idea is David is reclaiming all of God's borders for Israel. And so there's a crushing. And then verses 9 through 14, it's the idea of King Toy. What a name, Toy. And, and he doesn't want to be crushed. He is conciliatory and says, I want to make peace with David. And then it just simply ends with this commissioning of the servants, his officers, verses 15 through 18. And that's chapter 8. And you might say this morning, hey, good idea, let's skip it. But we're not going to. Um, there is much here in chapter 8 that is imperative for us. And the question may arise, does this even matter? Is this even relevant for us today? And let me remind you this morning, as we've worked our way through the Old Testament, as we've seen just in the past, the covenant of David, the promise that God made to David when he said, listen, David, your line, your throne will last forever. It will be an everlasting kingdom. This covenant. We understand this morning that as God's people, this covenant is ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. That through Abraham, and then David, and then Joseph, the Messiah is born. He lived a sinless life. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He conquered sin, death, and the grave, and will someday come back to rule and reign forever. And so, as we look at chapter 8 and we see what's happening here, we, we, we're reminded that as we work our way through the Old Testament, certainly every story whispers his name. He is the perfect priest, the perfect prophet, the perfect king. He is the ultimate deliverer, the shepherd, the savior. And here in this story, we find David as a precursor or a forerunner of the coming king and kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I say to you this morning, this chapter emphatically is important for us today. This foreshadowing is timely for us, is it not? Elections tomorrow? Did anyone not know that? Rick, did you know there's elections tomorrow? And the climate that we have today is the, is the idea that we're thinking about voting. We're thinking about the country. We're thinking about direction. Our friends to the south, their elections next year, and it's always entertaining to watch theirs. And, and the mind frame right now in our political climate is we're thinking about elections. We're thinking about prime ministers. We're thinking about presidents. We're thinking in our world stage about kings and kingdoms and nations. It certainly is Timely. I want you to know something. This idea of the coming of Christ and his kingdom ought to be transformational for God's people in the fact that our attitude about Christ and his kingdom and the proper response to Christ and his kingdom must come in line with the truth of who he is. I, don't, I, I hope I don't need to tell you this. I think we understand this, that we all have have ideas or thoughts or beliefs in our lives that really aren't accurate. Maybe you don't know that. But the fact is, all of us have ideas about certain things that just aren't in line with reality. Let me help you with some of these. Um, I grew up in an era where it was possible. Now, some of it's going to shock many of you, okay, but listen. It was possible to live your life for three weeks, a month, or two months, now listen to this, and never take a picture. Have you been? How many folks know what I'm talking about? Months, yes, okay. And never, ever take one picture. The truth is, I wish my parents would have taken more pictures because they were poor. We hardly have any pictures from that time frame. 
And we live in a world today where social media has sort of just adjusted the way we think. And here's what we have today. And if you think I'm talking to you, I am. That, that we take a picture of everything. And so, there are folks out there who actually believe that what you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner is so riveting that we are waiting on the edge of our seat just to see what you are having for lunch. Now, let me adjust your thinking here. Nobody cares. I mean, I'm a foodie. I like food. And, yeah, snap a picture. But if you're doing the three times a day, seven times a week of taking pictures of your food because you think the world is riveted to your life, if they are, you've got weak friends, man. It's not. But we think that. Let me, let me continue along this vein because I think I want to hit something else here. Um, I know that everyone thinks that their kids are geniuses. I mean, geniuses, now some of you don't. It's like, not mine, not mine. I get it. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, okay? Um, But you think they're great, and you think they're wonderful, and and so you want to make sure that every little action that they do at any time of the day, people want to see your children. Um, Some of the greatest advice that my my mother-in-law ever gave Kim and I, when we had our firstborn, she said this. She said, Kim, no one will ever think that your kids are as cute as you think they are. It's like, what? Are you serious? And can I tell you something? She was exactly right. Now, listen, I know you love your kids. I know it's great. But some of you think that everything that they do, we are just enamored by your children. And we are making them little narcissistic people that think that getting up in the morning requires a new post. That going off to school requires a new post. That winning a participation award requires a new post. Okay? And and you think that when people see your child, it's like the sun is in the background, there's a halo over their head, and they look beautiful. Let me show you what people see when they see your child. This is it. (laughs) If, If you're listening to this online, you won't understand this. There's a picture of a child with a Goonie mask on. He looks terrible. You can take that down now. Um, <laughs> thank you. My wife and I share a Facebook page, and I put that up a couple of weeks ago. And when she found out, she took it off within 10 minutes. Um, if that offends you, it's her fault. Okay? But, but we think that we think our kids, when they see our kids, that's what I see when I look at your kids. That's exactly what I see. All right? Some of us think that the world owes you. And you really believe that the world owes you something. The government owes you. The church owes you. Your parents owe you. And life's not fair, but they owe you. Listen, you keep on thinking like that, you're going to be in trouble the rest of your life. No one owes you anything. Anything. And the spiritual realm, if you want what you deserve, you will die and split hell wide open. So I wouldn't go that path either. Bad idea. So there's these things that we think in our heads and our minds, these misconceptions that we we say, we think this is true, we think this is right, but it's not. And and the list goes on. We could talk this morning about people who think that camping is fun and all these other things, but, but we won't go there. But acknowledge this morning. Don't we all have thoughts that have been adjusted or changed over time when we, we finally came in contact with the reality of it? My concern this morning is that that many of us, if not all of us, we must adjust our thoughts when it comes to Christ and his kingdom. Because we have these thoughts that I'm telling you this morning are not biblical. We have sentimentalized Jesus in such a way that, honestly, the New Testament writers would not even comprehend who you're talking about. And for whatever reason, maybe we had a granny who told us stories about Jesus, and they're always sweet, kind, wonderful, and that's good. Or maybe we came from a liberal church where the pastor or minister decided that certainly Jesus would never say this or do that. That sounds unkind or mean, and we know now that he never said that. We know more than the eyewitnesses 2,000 years ago could tell us, and he sort of picked and choose. He's picking and choosing what was the real Jesus. Or maybe in our own hearts and minds this morning, we have come 
away with this idea that we have, we have structured in our hearts and minds this Jesus that we're really comfortable with because he's manageable. And if the truth be known this morning for many of us, if we could give this visual picture of Christ as we see him, we would view him as the nicest guy in the world. I mean, always smiling, always happy. His greatest concern would be that you have a good time. He would wear a shirt that said, please pick me. I hope you like me. I'll make all your wildest dreams come true. Unfortunately, or fortunately, that is not the God of the Bible. Listen to me. Don't misunderstand me. Is Jesus Christ loving, kind, gracious, tender, merciful? The answer to that is what? Absolutely. You will not find a more beautiful Savior, a more loving man that walked this planet. But this morning, if that's the complete picture that you have of Christ, and that's it, listen to me. You do not have a complete picture of Christ. It is incomplete. It is inadequate. And it is idolatrous. You have made him into someone he is not. Do you want truth? Now listen. Before you answer that question, you better be honest with yourself. Because here's the fact in my own life. There are times that I really don't want truth because what I have right now is really comfortable for me. I don't want to rock the boat. I like it the way it is. And I know inevitably that the truth, if I, if I do come in contact with it, and I'm honest about it, it's going to change some things in my life. You better be careful. But I hope this morning as we've gathered together that the fact is that you and I sincerely desire truth. And let me say this. We should. Because it is only in the truth that we will ever find freedom. And every lie that we believe, whether it's about Jesus Christ and his kingdom or who we are or who somebody else is or our value or worth, only leads to bondage and slavery and ultimately death. And so it's important. And so this morning, what I'd like to do is just stay in the text in chapter 8 to think of David as a forerunner of Christ and his kingdom, this precursor, this foreshadowing, and then draw the conclusions from Scripture about Christ and his kingdom and how our attitude and response should be brought in line to who he is. So back in the text this morning, 2 Samuel chapter 8, I want you to see first off this crushing of David's enemies, crushing of his enemies. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting to me to know that while this crushing is happening, there is resistance. Uh, not everyone is happy about David's kingdom. Okay? And, and remember this, wherever David's kingdom expands in Israel, God, the God Yahweh, holds sway. It is God's kingdom. And the fact is, not everyone is happy about that. And there are reasons for it. For some folks in this list, they had their own ideas. They had their own identities. They were entrenched in the land. They lived there. And yet now they're being dispossessed. And I know some of you folks, you hear the stories of the Old Testament, and you think, there you go. God just mean and unkind and just, he's cruel. He's just, he just kicking people out. He's killing them all. Listen to me. Just so that you know, back in Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, God makes a covenant with Abraham. And he says, Abraham, this land is yours. It's all yours. But you're not getting it yet. Because the iniquity of the Amorite is not full. And what he's saying there is this. I'm not going to dispossess these people yet. I'm going to give them time to repent. Do you know how long between the promise to Abraham and when Joshua set foot in the promised land, how many years had gone by? 400. You want to talk about mercy and long-suffering? And now when David is on the throne and he's, he's, he's following God, obeying God, knows the Torah, um, he is dispossessing these people, now it has been 900 years of patience, mercy, and longing for repentance. Now think about that for a minute. This nation is about 100 and 
48 years old, the nation. 900 years. So they're entrenched, not happy about David's kingdom. Not only that, there is real evil. Real evil. Read the list of the nations there. And you'll be shocked how many of them wanted to annihilate Israel. Some things just don't change, do they? They don't change. There was a hatred for Israel. And if they could, they would have crushed them and driven them into the ocean. And so in this text, we see David as the coming king. He, he, he um, is crushing his enemies, and there's resistance. But here's the reality. You read the chapter, guess what happens? The reality is... David will reign. He will reign. Now, in our world today, I want you to know something. People resist the kingdom of Christ. On the whole, people and nations do not long to receive, but live to resist Christ's reign. David says that. What they say is, we will not have this man reign over us. And in our world today, there is a resisting, a real resisting of Christ's kingdom. And there are reasons. Can I tell you something that maybe you're not aware of, but not everyone's excited about Jesus today. Some of you aren't even excited, so that shouldn't surprise you, right? But, But not everyone's excited about Jesus, the Christ, or his kingdom. And the fact is, we are living in a climate today where you can say just about anything. You can even say religious things. You can say, I am a person of faith. I um, go to church. But the moment you say, I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a game changer, man. Is it not? Now, now you should take note of this because I want to tell you something. The name of Mohammed, the name of Buddha, the name of Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or Charles Taz Russell, or Mary Baker Eddy, that doesn't invoke that kind of response, ever. But there's something about this name that does. You want to know why? Because it's the name above every name. That's why. And there are people today who aren't excited about Jesus Christ. Not half at all. They think Christianity is foolishness. They think it's illogical. They think it's a crutch that you need, and they don't. They think it's a fairy tale. Ah, it's all made up. And the truth is they've never looked at it for themselves. They just parrot what they've heard. Not happy. Not excited about Jesus. And the fact is they know in their hearts that if they accept the truth of Christ and his kingdom, it will disrupt their lives. Don't want to receive that kingdom. Why? Because I know if I do, he is Lord. I've got to change some things. Not only are they not happy about Jesus, but another reason is, exactly like David's, there is real evil in the world. Listen to me, and, and listen well. You've got to stop saying things like there's a spark of divinity within all of us. That man is basically good. Can I tell you something? Man is basically bad. And there is real evil in this world. It has nothing to do with where a kid's born or his education or, or, or society. There is evil in this world today, and there is much evil today directed toward Christ and his kingdom. When a young man can walk into a community college in, in Oregon and line people up to execute them, and the crime for those people is simply that they are Christians, it's evil. It is sheer evil. When ISIS can grab Christian Syrian missionary women and publicly rape them, torture, and behead them, it is sheer evil. When 12-year-old children are executed for the cause of Christ. It is evil. And we better get our heads 
out of the sand. This is not divisive. This is not fear-mongering. These are the facts. There is evil in the world that we live in today, and not everyone's excited about Christ and his kingdom. You get that? But here's the truth now. It doesn't matter. Because Christ will crush his enemies. Some of you are nervous about that. Let me say it again. Jesus Christ will crush his enemies. And he is coming back again. And when he comes, he will not be spit upon. He will not be mocked. He will not be ridiculed. He will not be crucified. He is coming back to rule and reign as the righteous God of heaven, and there will be peace, and he will crush his enemies. Crush them. You say, that's not the Jesus I know. Fair enough. Then what I'm telling you is you don't know Jesus. Period. Listen to these verses. Okay? I'm just going to give you three this morning as we, we move on from this point. But you need to see this. Daniel chapter 2 this morning. Just It'll be on the, the board. If you're in your Bible, turn there. And I won't give you the whole context, but, but you look at it. Daniel 2 this morning. Many of you know the story. It's the, it's the, the dream that, that Nebuchadnezzar has about the image with the gold, the silver, brass, right? And it goes all the way down. And Daniel gets a vision of what this means, and it's, it's a, a peek into the future that God gives what the, what the kingdoms that are coming look like. Verse number 44. And in, the, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever for as much. As thou sawest, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. And if you doubt this, check it out. He is talking about Jesus Christ. Look at it. Talking about Christ. This stone cut out of the mountains without hands. It's, it's Jesus Christ. Um, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. And the great God shall make known to the king what shall come to pass thereafter and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. Here's what Daniel says. Daniel says, listen, there is coming one who will pulverize, pulverize the nations. Something about ruling with a rod of iron, it's Jesus Christ. Say, so, okay, that's great, Rick, but here you are in the Old Testament, you know, apocalyptic writing, whatever. Okay, let's go to the New Testament. Okay, Matthew 21, verse number 44. And again, you got to look at the context. But he's talking to the Pharisees, and what he says to the Pharisees is, listen, you're rejecting the stone, the cornerstone. It's Christ. It's absolutely Christ. And here's what he says. And whosoever shall fall on this stone, Jesus Christ, shall be broken. And he's not talking about a broken spirit that I'm coming. He's talking about broken. Broken. Like destroyed. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. This is Jesus. And what he's saying is this. You want to fall on me, I'll break you. You want to resist me when I fall on you, I will crush you to powder. One more this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And, and look, if you would, at verse number 5. He says, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you might be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in the saints and to be admired and all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Listen, I know some of you are sitting thinking, that's not my grandfather's Buick. It's not your grandfather's Buick. 
This is the word of God. This is Jesus Christ. And what he is saying here is, listen, when I come, I will crush my enemies. If this morning it troubles you from 2 Samuel chapter 8 and what David did there, I want you to know something. David's conquest will pale in comparison to the coming of Christ. Pale. We didn't even read Revelation chapter 19 this morning. About the one who comes back on a horse, faithful and true, to make war. His enemies are slain by his mouth. Some of you are sitting here this morning thinking, wait, Rick, are you advocating now that the church go out? You know, and, and, and we're going to make war, and we're going to convert or die. This is going to buy the sword. Absolutely not. I'm not reading the Koran this morning. Read the word of God. Jesus says in chapter 18 of the book of John, talking to Pilate, he says, listen, this kingdom is not, my kingdom is not of this world right now. If it was, my, my servants would have fought. They don't. They don't fight. And then he goes on in John chapter 18, he talks about the fact that I have a kingdom of truth. Paul picks up the same language in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. And there's conflict there, and he says, listen, I want you to know something. This conflict, it's not just physical. There's a spiritual battle that is raging, and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are spiritual, the pulling down of strongholds. The, tr- the song that we sang this morning reiterates that truth. Oh, church, arise. We stand against the devil's lies, reasoning and arguments. An army bold whose battle cry is love, not hate, not kill, love. Our call to war is to love the captive soul. You know how many people are captive this morning to Satan? And our call is to love them, to show them to Christ, to remind them that, that whatever the devil told you was a lie and will never bring you what you think, ever but to rage against the captive, the captor. And then with a sword that makes the wounded whole, the word of God is sharp, quick, and powerful. It cuts, it's surgical, it heals. The church can be crushed today by Christ's enemies. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, who shall separate from the love of Christ? The answer is nobody, but as you go through the list, he says, shall tribulation and famine and nakedness and sword? And the answer is no. But the church does struggle. We are not a political entity. We are a bride. And we are waiting for our groom, who just happens to be the king of the universe. So what do we get from this? Two things. It reminds us that if we're not part of Christ's kingdom now, we will be crushed. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess. And this morning, listen to me. You will bow the knee to Christ. You will. You'll do it this side of glory, or you'll do it later when it's too late, but you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His enemies will be crushed. And then for those who know him today, what does this tell us? It tells us that injustice will end. There is coming a day when the skies will burst forth, Jesus Christ will come, and the Prince of Peace will rule, and everything will be made right. It's not Donald Trump. It's not. It's not. It's Jesus Christ who is the Lord and Savior and the only one that can fix the mess of this sin-sick world. And so Christ will crush his enemies. Now here's the great thing about the text that we're in, about David's kingdom and God's kingdom. There can be conciliation. You see that king toy? Wasn't going to toy with David. It's like what I did there, that little pun, toy, toy. Nice. He sees everyone being crushed, and he says, okay, Dave, I don't want to be crushed. Let's make peace. You know what David does? He makes peace with him. Listen, uh, Toy did not want to be subdued, rebellious, or crushed, and he need not be struck down. There was an alternative for him, an alternative. Can I tell you something this morning for you and I? There's an alternative. You need not be struck down. One of, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but 
that the wicked turn from his way and live, turn you, turn you from your evil ways, for why will you die? I have to tell you something. What a great, you talk about an olive branch. God says, I have no desire or delight in the death of the wicked. My enemies, I'm telling them, turn, turn. Why won't you live? There's great hope here, my friend. You don't have to be crushed. You can turn to living God. And this is the glory of our God, the great king of heaven, who has those who are enemy combatants who have sinned against him constantly. We've broken his laws. We've broken his commands. We do it daily. We are enemy combatants. We will not have this man rule over us. And what he says is, listen, you don't have to be crushed. I will send my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for you. And instead of being crushed, you can have peace with me. You can be reconciled to me. And, and this is a great thing. Not only does he offer peace, but when we come to him, he adopts us as his own. It's a wonderful thing. It gives us great hope. Listen to me this morning. Christianity is inclusive. If you're a sinner this morning, there is room at the cross for you. It's inclusive. Anyone can come, but now listen to me. You are not going to come in accordance to your own plans and your own ideas and your own way. You do not make a deal with the sovereign king of the universe. Say, okay, I don't want to be crushed, but I want to do this, this, and this. But I want you to save me as well, because I really don't like the idea of hell stuff. But I want to live my own life. Listen to me. You do not make deals with the sovereign king of the universe. It is his way, and only his way. Not yours, not mine, not anyone's, but his. And so, when we submit, repent, and faith trust Jesus Christ, there can be conciliation. Then finally this morning, there's a commissioning of of David's servants. Verse number 15 of our text, back in 2 Samuel chapter 8, it tells us something interesting about David. It said, David reigned over all Israel, and David executed judgment and justice unto all people. All people. It reminds us that David was a righteous king, but it also reminds us that his cabinet was to, to further the kingdom, to live righteously. I know this morning, we're not kings, we're not princes, we're not priests, we're not, but the truth is, we're part of God's kingdom. And God has placed you somewhere. And I just wonder this morning, if we as God's people, citizens of heaven, redeemed by the blood of Christ, where God has placed us, do the people that we come in contact with know and understand that we're citizens of heaven? Do they know and understand that the coming kingdom is one of love, peace, joy, righteousness, integrity, honesty? Is there something within our lives that says to them, listen, I am not a child of this world. I am in the world. I'm not of the world. I am a citizen of heaven. My king is coming, and there is something in my life that reveals and reflects that fact. Talking to a dear friend of ours the other night, you remind me of this illustration. If, if I walked across the street this morning, and I walked across Indian Creek, I was struck by a Mack truck going 150 miles an hour. Don't get excited. I know some of you are like, yeah, that would be great. And I walked in this morning, and just like this, I came up here and said, listen, I want to tell you something. This morning, I was struck by a Mack truck going 150 miles an hour. How many folks would believe me? Good. None of you. I was worried this morning about asking the question. None of you. Why? Because a Mack truck alters you incredibly at 150 miles an hour. Does it not? Listen to me. When the Spirit of the living God the spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead comes into your life. He alters you dramatically. Dramatically. I'm not talking about sinless perfection this morning, but I am talking about when people rub shoulders with us, there should be something about that spirit that has altered our life so that they see we are citizens of a different kingdom. Charles Colson gives a, an example or illustration of a woman who is on a psychiatrist's couch. And you got to lay down on the couch right and tell your story. And so she's on the couch, and she, she is exhausted at the endless lifestyle of partying, drugs, alcohol, and sex. And she's just, she's devastated by it. 
And the psychiatrist leans forward and says, well, why don't you stop? And the woman sat up on the sofa and said, do you mean that I don't have to do what I want to do? And the answer to that is, yes. And more so for the believer in Christ. Okay, how many this morning, there are times that you really want to be unkind? Can I see your hands? Just be honest. Come on, don't lie. Don't lie in church. Okay, right? You see those pictures on Facebook and you think, I wish I just had one day of honest Facebook. And I would tell, right? And you, you, want, you want to be unkind. I mean, it's, or you want to be mean to somebody. A jerk at work. Wouldn't it be nice just to whatever you're thinking right now? <laughs> Give you any thoughts? Dan, stop it. Isn't, aren't there times that you would rather be lazy? Aren't there times that you would rather be greedy or dishonest or selfish or abrasive? You don't have to answer because I know you do already. I see you. And you see me. But can I tell you something this morning? Because of the risen Christ, because of the Spirit of God, because of the Word of God and His church, I don't have to do what my flesh wants to do. Rick, are you saying, as a Christian, I don't have to do this anymore? What I want to do in the flesh? And the answer is yes. 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 You know what I mean by that? Yes. You don't. You don't. Would to God that we as his people today would change our perspective. Listen to me. The king of glory is coming. He's coming. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And when he comes, my friend, listen to me. Yes, loving, kind, gracious, the Jesus of the Bible. But That's not a full picture. Because in his love, he must be just and holy and righteous. He is coming to rule and reign. It will not be by popular demand. It won't be. We're not going to usher in the kingdom as the world becomes more Christianized. Look around. It ain't happening. He's not coming by popular demand. He's coming. And it doesn't matter what your reasoning is and all the things that you have constructed in your mind. He is coming to crush his enemies. But you don't have to be crushed. (laughs) Mercy kisses justice at the cross. And you can know him today. You can repent and believe. And we pray that you do that. And this morning, if you're God's child today, can I tell you something? In light of who Christ really is, in light of his kingdom and his coming, in light of the power of the Spirit of God, I don't have to do what I've been excusing myself for over and over again. Because I want to, because my flesh tells me to, because I'm angry or upset or I'm greedy or I'm lazy or I'm selfish. Stop. By the Spirit of God, by the grace of God, we don't have to do what our flesh wants to do. And we can show a, a remnant or a foreshadowing of this coming kingdom by being people of love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, self-control. The king is coming. Are you ready? You can be crushed if you like. But you'll be crushed having been warned. You can make an agreement of peace, repenting and trusting in him. Let's have a word of prayer this morning.